Welcome to Hot Topics. You know, we've had some requests about is there a rule of thumb method that could be used to determine the size of the grounded conductor, you know, maybe routed from the transformer on a pole or uh, a pad mounted transformer. Uh, how could an electrician, for example, look into the panel board that you see and determine if your neutral conductor is large enough? without having, uh, you know, to go to the code book, and of which you don't usually have with you. Well, see in the uh, information, you see the overcurrent device is 350 amp. So you would take the multiplier, and it always works, 189 times 350, you come up with 66,150. Now the, uh, say your conductor, uh, phase conductors with 350 kcm. We're just saying that. Then you would take 350,000 kcm, whatever it is, divide it by 66,150, and if you're 50% or more, you're plenty large, see? So uh, you say, well, all right, I am. When I do my math there, I am 50%. So I'm large enough and I don't have to worry about it. My grounded conductor coming in is large enough. Then the next thing you know, all the other uh, things in there would be sized in the same way. See, you have a number two. And just like you see it in the table here. I use this illustration because it's uh, in our uh, electrical design book, uh, volume two, and it's figure 16-27. But... This is your multiplier that you use, and then just divide this circular mill rating into whatever your circular mill rating would be of the conductor. Now, I'll grant you, if it's uh, uh, you know smaller than KC mill ratings, then you would need to uh, go to your code book and find out what would be your uh, cross-sectional area of that conductor. But uh, again, after you. Uh, you know, you're in your own facility, you, you begin to know that anyway. But where you're uh, out, maybe troubleshooting or looking at a panel board for the first time, and uh, you you know that the circular mill rating is 300 kc mill or larger, this is the procedure you use, and you're home free. But, you know, you kind of, you want to have a 50%, and you get that by just uh, taking the 300 and 50 times 1,000, giving you 350,000, divide that by 66,150 circular mil, and you're going to come up with a conductor, a uh, uh, grounded conductor that is 50% or larger. So you're in good shape. So uh, this is a rule of thumb method that, that you could use. And then, of course, you have to look at 220.61. If you had a one alt coming in, then you know you're large enough. You know, it's a, you have more neutral load than you have face-to-face -face load. Then you know you're going to have a neutral large enough. And you just, uh, as you know, 70B says in Chapter 7, review and look at your circuit mapping, uh, uh, you know, label. And if, you're, uh, if you have more neutral load there, then you have phase-to-phase -phase load. You know the neutral's large enough, and that 220.61 prevails. See? But if you have a neutral load smaller than uh, uh, number two, you have to bring it up to number two because it, it provides your path for your ground fault to travel over. So this is a rule of thumb that you could use for the grounded conductor routed as a neutral say, or grounded conductor, either one, from your transformer uh, supplied by the ut utility or maybe even a customer-owned type transformer. So that's what this illustra uh, illustration, excuse me, is illustrating when you want to use a rule of thumb method to determine what the grounded or grounded neutral conductor would be. Now let's take a look at this uh, figure 16 uh, dash 113A in uh, Stalkup's Electrical Design Book, Volume 2. And you've probably seen maybe this illustration before, 
But again, uh, we were asked, is there a kind of a rule of thumb that electricians used to use in the field to determine the size of an equipment grinding conductor based upon the overcurrent protection device without referencing Table 250.122 in the NEC? Now, you can see it's a multiplier up to 40 amp overcurrent device. You know, that include 15, 20, 30, and 40. Use 260 times the overcurrent device. And that would give you the circular mill rating that you would need. And usually it's a roundup thing that you would have to do. Uh, now, if you drop down, you can see it in action here. We have a 40 amp overcurrent device here that requires a number 10 conductor for an equipment ground in accordance with 250.122 in the NEC. And of course, you can use copper, uh, copper clad, aluminum uh, sizes, you know, usually aluminum's one size larger. But notice we take the 40 amp overcurrent device, we multiply it by 260, we come up with 2,400 circular mil, which requires a number 10 from table 8 to chapter 9 in the back of your code book. Now, if you had a 100 amp overcurrent device, uh, it would be uh, a greater value that you would use. So you take 131 times the overcurrent device, so a 100, excuse me, a 100 amp overcurrent device times 130 is 13,100, and that would require number eight. So you're, you're moving up uh, from your circular mill rating in accordance with uh, uh, table eight to chapter nine in the back of your code book. Now, we know just uh, from our experience that a number 14, uh, uh, you know, is going to be required for a 15 amp device, a number 12 for a 20 amp device, a number 10 for 30. But when you start getting into the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and on up, then we have to use a kind of a different multiplier to uh, obtain that. Uh, and, and of course, if you're a regular troubleshooter every day, and you have to go into a panel board, then you pretty well uh, memorize everything up to 100. It's just in your mind that you know. And of course, if you had metal conduit EMT that you might have in the drawing, as you see here, uh, then you know the EMT uh, can serve as an equipment grounding means in accordance with uh, 250.118 of the code, see? Uh, so sometimes they pull an equipment ground to have redundant grounding. We know as a rule of thumb, EMT will pull about 90% of a fault. The equipment ground only pulls 10%. But should there become an, a restriction in some manner where you have a connectors, couplings, and things, and due to time and movement of the conduit due to little small earthquakes and other uh, means that might occur uh, that might damage, you know, the connections. Then say you're, and we're just saying this, say your EMT only pulls 70% of the fault, then your equipment ground would pull 30. And, it, and if it got to a point that the EMT didn't pull any of the short circuit current, it had a restriction that would stop it, then your equipment ground, you know, is capable of picking up 100%. So that's why the code many uh, years ago required an equipment ground to be full size. You know, when I first got in the trade years ago as a young man, in Romex, uh, you know, we would have a very small equipment ground. But then we learned, no, that, that doesn't get the job done. And we would pull sometimes smaller conductors uh, in a conduit for an equipment ground. But we learned, no, that's not the way to do that. And we, a lot of that was learned from ground faults not being cleared properly and fires being developed uh, and occur because of it. So we're just sizing equipment grinding conductors here uh, in accordance with 250.122 and table 250.122 based upon a multiplier that provides a means of uh, rule of thumb method that could be used in the field when you don't have maybe a code book handy uh, that you just wanted to use a, 
uh, say, a rule of thumb method to determine if you're large enough. And then sometimes, you know, the another uh, method they could use, they just say, is the equipment ground at least 25%, you know, up to 50% larger than the ungrounded conductor. They use that method sometimes. So it just depends upon the procedure and method that you, you know, you've been taught to use. But that's what this figure is uh, illustrating uh, to the user of the NEC.